Welcome, everyone, uh, and thank you for coming on this uh, spring day when the temptation to be outside is, is, is great, uh, and many, many have fallen, I think, uh, <laughs> to that temptation, which we all deserve, but uh, the, the reward for, for this gathering, I'm sure, will be, will be richer. Um, my name is Ana Lopico. I'm the director of the King Juan Carlos Center at New York University. Uh, we're immensely uh, happy today to continue what has been um, remarkable and moving and, and quite heavy uh, set of conversations uh, and events hosted uh, by our resident King Juan Carlos Chair uh, for spring 2017, Monse Armengo. I want to thank Laura Turegano, uh, the Associate Director, who is here uh, and who has made everything uh, wonderful and logistical uh, and strategic happen, and always does. Um, I want to thank Joe Lavagni, the, d the directora, the chair of the Spanish department, the, di the Department of Spanish and Portuguese, um, for her support and for nominating Monse uh, and, and bringing to us a, 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 an unprecedented um, set of conversations and uh, public scholarship and, and research and documentary work. Um, I'm going to introduce Monse, though she has uh, re reproved me for long <laughs> introductions, so I'm going to speak as quickly as, as I can, but I think that she merits the honorifics granted to her by her, by her, uh, by her nomination. Um, I want to make you aware that um, Monse has organized a, a set of four events rather than the traditional um, symposium that the visiting chairs uh, usually organize. Um, Today's is the, 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 the third? Is yes, it? the second lecture. The second, the second event, um, and I'll introduce uh, uh, Monse shortly, but the next event will be on Monday, April 24th, uh, entitled Imperfect Transition and Challenges of the Present, Victims, Terrorism, and the State. Her final panel, uh, which is more a conference, um, is on May 2nd, Tuesday, May 2nd, also at this time, titled Amnesty International Spain, When Crime is at Home, Journalism and Engagement, Denouncing a Past that Persists, From the Valle de los Caídos to the, right, far, to the Rise of the Far Right, um, with a distinguished group uh, in both cases of um, interlocutors. It's my pleasure and my honor to introduce Monser Mengo. Monser Mengo Martin has been at the uh, King Juan Carlos Center this spring uh, as the King Juan Carlos Chair in Spanish Culture and Civilization. She is a distinguished Spanish journalist and investigative documentary filmmaker who has worked at Televisión de Catalunya since 1985. Through her work as a documentary filmmaker, Armengo has unearthed and presented new evidence about the social history of repression in Spain during the dictatorship of Francisco Franco. She has opened and made possible uh, a conversation about public and political memory and has brought into action and into the public sphere um, people subjects uh, who have taken hold of their own history uh, and tried to step into the void that the state has not quite filled in taking up 40 years of dictatorship during 40 years uh, of democracy. She's the co-director with Ricard Bellis of Los Niños Perdidos del Franquismo from 2002, The Graves of Silence, I'm going to say them in English, in 2003, um, the 927, 927 on the train to hell about the Spanish victims of the Holocaust in 2004. More recently, she's directed two high profile documentaries, one of which we screened at the beginning of her tenure here, Abuelo Te Sacaré de Aquí, uh, which is about the history of the Valle de los Caídos, uh, a fascist mausoleum in the middle of Europe uh, honoring Franco. She is also the director of Los Internados del Miedo, the Institutions of Fear, uh, which investigated and documented the abuse and enslavement of children in state-owned Catholic orphanages during the dictatorship and even part of the transition. She, her, her documentaries have won uh, numerous awards, which I'm not gonna cite uh, in deference to her. Uh, and uh, it's important to note that her documentary work has been published uh, uh, in book form and has become a resource for human rights agencies and activists 
um, as we saw in her last presentation with the special rapporteur to the United Nations. During her tenure here, she has not only organized this series of public events and screenings, um, she's also been teaching a remarkable graduate seminar uh, on public memory uh, and the recovery of historical memory through documentary. It's my great pleasure to welcome and present to you Monse Armengo. Thank you, Anna. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much to show for my biography for the fourth time. I so thank <laughs> you. So, uh, first of all, I would like to thank Ana Maria Dopico, director of the King Juan Carlos Center for the organization of this event. Uh, this is my second and final lecture as chair of at this institution during the spring 2017. And so many thanks also, Joe Lavagni, director of the Spanish and Portuguese department, department at NYU, and the person who nominated me for this position. And as always, many thanks to Laura, Laura Turegano, Maria Jose Lavandera, and Luis Perez, uh, because without them, this event would not be possible. And of course, thank you, you uh, all for coming to joining this discussion in this nice spring evening to joining this discussion about the potential of documentary films and the investigative uh, journalism as means of civic empowerment. It gives me great pleasure to share this stage with my admired colleague Richard Schweitz, someone who has become my friend over the years by working together on several documentaries. Richard Swite is, is a Nashville-born uh, author and journalist who has lived in Barcelona for more than 20 years. He was uh, co-founder of Barcelona Metropolitan, a monthly city magazine, and was its senior editor, editor for 14 years. He has 10 published books of narrat narrative nonfiction, including Chess Chevrolet and Fidel's Oldsmobile on the road of Cuba, and he latest that I recommend you, Invisible Nation, Homeless Families in America. I remember perfectly how the idea uh, for this book was born. It was during uh, the filming of one of our documentaries that we made together in 2008. We drove across the United States and we realized how many families with children were living in trailer parks, uh, motels, and cars, and cars. And that is when Richard decided that he had to write a book about this. It takes a wage of nearly $18 per hour to afford a two-bedroom rental anywhere in the United States. That it's more than the income of two minimum wage workers in much of the nation. This is a crisis that will only get worse. In an excellent blend on, of on-the-ground research, Richard Schweig reports from shabby hotels among homeless families and in several cities across the country over the course of years. Invisible Nation is a must-read for policymakers, students of sociology, or anyone else concerned about the widening wage wage gap in our country. This is not my quote. This is by Dale Maherit, Pulitzer Prize winner and author of, of Some Place Some Place Like America, Tales from the New Great Depression. Richard has participated in the making of more than two dozen documentaries for the Catalan uh, public uh, television. And it's an honor for me to have been given the opportunity to work with him in some of them. For example, during former President uh, Barack Obama nomination in 2008, it was Richard who convinced me to make a documentary about Fanny Luhammer, an unknown woman, not only for the Catalan or Spanish audience, but also for many North Americans. Hammer was an illiterate African-American woman from Mississippi who fought for civil rights within the Democratic Party. Richard was also the production manager of the Oscar-nominated documentary Balseros, an internationally acclaimed film that has won a lot of awards, including an Emmy. 
I believe that the secret of our um, professional and personal good relationship is that Richard and I, uh, we defend a committed journalism. We don't agree in a neutral, impartial, or aseptic journalism, but it's absolutely necessary for journalism to be rigorous. We need commitment and rigor because it's the only way we can give information to the citizens in order for them to make their own decisions as individuals or as society as a whole. As a whole. In other words, to give civic empowerment through journalism. So it's a pleasure to give the floor to Richard. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Monsi. Uh, firstly, my thanks to Monsi Armand Go, not only for inviting me here, but for the decade of past decade of when I've had the pleasure of working with her. Uh, she has an innate sense of justice, which serves her to speak for the voiceless, to raise a cry of alarm where one is needed and not being sounded, to speak truth to power. But she also has a journalist's sympathetic curiosity. And uh, what I think was your last documentary for public television before you came here mm -hmm. uh, was a documentary about how people with physical disabilities deal with finding sexual satisfaction. And it was an elegant, frank, and fascinating answer to that question. Uh, I also, secondly, uh, want to thank uh, the King Juan Carlos Center for hosting us. It's a real privilege to be here. Um, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the things that Monsi mentioned also. One, one of the things that, uh, that she and I share is a belief that we have a journalistic responsibility to inform, and more specifically to inform about those things that have been forgotten or ignored, but still cry out for justice and recognition. This means keeping historical memory alive. At Monsi's groundbreaking 2002 work about the officially sanctioned theft of babies from jails and hospitals across Spain during the Franco regime, raised in families not their own, accomplished this. And her 2015 documentary about the children who were deemed orphans and wards of the state during the dictatorship and how those brutal years living in institutions marked them for life did the same thing. These are only a couple of examples of the volume of work she has done over the years to call public attention to issues lost or ignored, illuminating our important collective historical memory. We also did this in 2008 when we accompanied the Mississippi Democratic delegation to Denver to film Barack Obama receiving his party's nomination exactly 40 years after Fannie Lou Hamer won the right to serve as a Democratic Party convention delegate from Mississippi. Hamer was an illiterate sharecropper with a will of steel who withstood the worst the white world of the Mississippi Delta threw at her, insisting on her right to vote and to take her rightful seat at the table. Barack Obama would be the first to tell you that he stood on the broad shoulders of Fannie Lou Hamer and those like her who risked their lives by refusing to back down to Jim Crow. In 2008, Barack Obama was in the news all over the world while we were making the documentary but not the many years of struggle and people like Fannie Lou Hamer who had made it possible. And we had the pleasure and privilege of bringing those things to a viewing public. One of the pleasures of working with Monse lies in her judgment of what is important. She has fine-tuned her journalistic instinct over the years, and she has a sixth sense of where and what to film. Many more times than once, she has suggested to me that we needed to film something that I was dubious about. And she was invariably proved right. Uh, as only one example, I remember that while we were filming the Obama Hamer documentary, she read a blurb in a local newspaper, unusual enough for a lot of journalists to read a local newspaper where they <laughs> might happen to be. Uh, and uh, the blurb said that the Ku Klux Klan was meeting in North Mississippi, a long drive from where we were. As a Southerner, my dislike of the Klan overcame my journalistic judgment, and I said I didn't think it would be worth the time or the effort to go. She prevailed, we went, and the resulting footage was excellent. Uh, she and her colleagues at Catalan Public Television have taught me a great deal about journalism. Uh, I vividly remember coming here to New York with a crew from the station just after September 11, 2001. 
near the rubble of the Trade Center was a wall, you may remember this if you were here, plastered with photos, pleas, phone numbers of loved ones trying to get in touch with their loved ones who had been at the World Trade Center that day. The director told me to start calling all those phone numbers and asking them for an interview. And I winced, and uh, I could hardly bring myself to do it, really, to intrude on these people in this moment of terrible sorrow and uncertainty. Uh, and the director also began reading numbers off the wall, making his own calls. And one of the people he reached was a woman from El Salvador who said we could come up to her third floor walk up and interview her. She told us how she'd come to the U.S. for the sake of her daughter, had worked and scrimped and saved as a domestic all those years here to send that daughter, her only child, to college, and how the girl had gotten a job at the World Trade Center, and how proud they had both been. Uh, the girl had called her mom, terrified from the office just after the first plane hit, and then the line went dead. And by the end of the mother's story, we were actually all in tears, as you might imagine. Uh, then she, this girl's mother said something to us that I've never forgotten. She said, uh, I hope they don't take revenge by bombing Afghanistan. I don't want to see one more drop of blood shed. And that we could bring that mother and what seemed to me to be a profound and grieving message to people was a real privilege. And I learned that many times people want and need to tell their lives and that journalists need to be the tools that they can use to do so. Um, Monsi and I also share a belief that the principal duty of journalists and documentarians is to spend their time being the eyes and ears of the people in our communities to speak for them and protect them. While most folks go about their workday lives too busy to spend a whole day, a week, or month identifying drugs that could be harmful to them, but which even so are still on the market. People's lives are often too busy to allow them to educate themselves, so it is up to journalists to do so. We can choose to do this about the latest film stars, baseball games, or political brouhaha's, but Monty and I have both chosen to concentrate on other things. And when I found out, for instance, that in our nation, one of the very richest in the world, over two and a half million children are homeless every year, I didn't know what to do except to begin writing about it to understand how such a thing could be, how, how we could live our lives side by side with families that are living in their cars children being raised in cars and cheap motel rooms in, in almost all of our neighborhoods, regardless of where those neighborhoods are. Uh, and here, of course, in New York, uh, we know what kind of shelters they get sent to when they go to shelters, uh, when there is some place for them to go into a shelter, uh, which often there is not. Um, still, these children are often invisible to us. They look like other children, and most of the handful of books about homeless families that I could find were seriously outdated. So I set out to write a book about it in order to first understand the problem myself, then try and communicate what I learned to others. This to me seems to be a classic journalistic process. The job of the journalist is to carry the message to viewers and readers that those children are out there, or those harmful drugs that are still being prescribed, or the healthy fo unhealthy foods on offer at the local supermarket. Monster's documentaries of wrongs yet to be acknowledged, much less made right, has illuminated some dark corners of Spanish history for us. And they also communicate the bleak quotidian reality of how daily life was lived in those shadows and what people had to endure. It's important to understand this in our own world, to learn how people are going about their daily lives. And for this, I'm a, a big fan personally of oral histories. Uh, as some of you may know, in the Anglo-Saxon print tradition, the Londoner Henry Mayhew was the first English popular journalist. In 1850, he interviewed hundreds of poor Londoners and was the first to publish an oral history like that in English. Uh, were it not for Mayhew and the novelist Charles Dickens, we would have virtually no historical memory of London during the mid-19th century. No knowledge of what life life was like in the streets for the great number of poor who lived and died there and for the average person who lived and died there. In the 20th century, in this country, we had the wonderful oral historian Studs Terkel, who died in 2008 at the age of 96. He left volumes of interviews, wonderful interviews, with ordinary citizens who described their lives. And those volumes will be read in the decades and centuries to come 
by people who want to understand how the average North American lived in our time. And for the 21st century, um, there's hardly anyone under 30 who does not know Brandon Stanton's marvelous oral histories in his global series, Humans of New York. Uh, it's wonderful oral history. It's a cliche, but it's true that we are condemned to repeat the history that we do not remember. And to remember our history has never been more important than in these days of an alarming populist tide. Oral histories and documentaries are tools we as journalists can provide for the public. And hopefully, once we jog their historical memories, they will use these tools to prevent the abuses of history from repeating themselves. Thank you so much. <laughs> this is an, an overdose of very nice and very kind <laughs> comments. <laughs> OK, uh, now we are going to share with you a few examples of different uh, documentaries. The following are some clips from Balseros. Maybe you can put a little in context this, this documentary. Yeah. And I'm going to prepare. Okay. Uh, Balseros uh, started as a half-hour documentary for the public television station where Monse works and I work. Uh, and it was done by a director named Carlos Bosque, who's a friend of mine for many years, and called me one day and said he wanted me to locate the families in the United States of certain Cubans who were getting on rafts. This was during the time... We started this in, during the time Bill Clinton's administration, when people were being allowed for a few days to leave Cuba on rafts. And uh, at least 30,000 people did so. Uh, the number has never really been determined. But Carlos made half an hour, and then we did another half an hour. Huh? And then he decided that really what he had was the material for a film. And so we got back in touch with the people that we had followed, and we followed them to the United States. First we went to Guantanamo, where they were originally sent for 13 months, and then we followed the seven people really over the course of seven years in the United States. Um, and the resulting film won uh, audience awards both in Havana and Miami. So, which right away said something to us that we'd done something right. Uh, and, well, I'll show you a, 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 a brief glimpse of it. Uh, for me, what, was, what I took away from it most of all, and which is applicable today, perfectly applicable, is that when you're a refugee, uh, when you flee your home country, there comes a time when you lose your individuality. It's like going into the Marines or something. You, you're just a number. Uh, and you go through a certain bureaucratic process, and you get somewhere. And then in, once you're in that somewhere, your personality begins to reassert itself. And whoever you were before you left is once again who you are, basically, in, in your new home. Uh, and it, it was fascinating. We, we stayed very much in touch with the family. We were the only means that the families in Cuba had of knowing how their loved ones who had left were doing. Uh, we, Carlos had the great idea of bringing video that we had shot back to uh, Cuba to show family members so that they could see their own family members in, Havana, in, pardon me, in Guantanamo or in the United States. Uh, so it was great. It was, I'd never been to Cuba before. It was wonderful. Yo no sé 
sabía que mi hermano Rafael pretendía irse del país en una balsa. Hasta que me enteré que había sido una de las más grandes y con muchos delincuentes. No quiero tomar, no quiero comer, no quiero nada. Meterme en una discoteca a bailar ocho horas sin parar. O hasta, hasta que los pies me digan basta, hasta que yo diga basta. Y sí. después empezar a trabajar porque sabemos que no va a ser fácil. No vamos a tener tiempo de vacaciones ni nada por el estilo. Lo que pasó en el 94 es que todo el mundo se quiso ir. Y hubo quien tuvo la facilidad de hacer una balsa. Como yo, tenía el dinero, tenía las condiciones, tenía los amigos. El sí, el sí que es el techo. Pero hubo mucha gente que no tuvieron esa oportunidad. Incluso gente como Rafael vino a verme. Sí, Rafael llegó cuando yo estaba construyendo mi barca. Él no podía ir en mi embarcación porque ya todo estaba completo. Pero mi hermano estaba haciendo una embarcación y necesitaban otra gente porque él tenía la embarcación y todo, pero no tenía el dinero para poder mover la embarcación. El camión costaba 30 dólares. Y no se puede ir porque no tiene dinero. Porque le faltan muchas cosas. Ella está construyendo su embarcación en casa de mi mamá y le faltan muchas cosas todavía para poder seguir. Necesito como 200 o 250 dólares. Para, eso comprar otro, para comprar las cámaras que me faltan, la lona que me falta y todo lo que me falta. Sí, porque aquí, no, aquí, aquí o tienes que ir más bien a acostarte con un extranjero que no sea de tu gusto o más bien tienes que ponerte a negociar expensas de que te cojan presa para poder tener los 30 dólares. O si no, hacer barbaridades de cosas. Te lo digo porque yo jineteaba para poder mantener mi familia. y nada nos importó si llegamos bien si morían también por eso fue que decidí ni traer a mis hijas ni traer a mi esposa en ese momento porque si perdíamos la vida la perdíamos nosotros en una travesía que era como una aventura sin final hubieron muchos factores que estaban en contra de nosotros el clima muchas veces Teníamos que esperar que llegara la lupa, nosotros poder seguir trabajando. Lluvia, torrenciales de lluvia. Pero... Rendir la vida. En este momento, en una avanza se va a la vida de uno. Hay que esperar, hay que tener calma. Esperar que el tiempo se pone malo y se pone bueno también. vacía, tú debes saber de que ahí hubo alguien y al saber de que ahí hubo alguna persona tienes que saber de que estaba muerto y eso cada vez que remábamos y remábamos y remábamos nos partía el hambre ves en el medio del mar en una balsa de noche todo oscuro y sintiendo gente gritando por allá por acá eh se me rompió la llanta ayúdenme y escuchando niños llorando es lo más feo que hay en la vida. Con los balseros de la base no me te conté, no, no había una seguridad de nada. No supimos nada de mis Clay y de Eduardo hasta dentro de unos meses. Mi clave de la otra, la otra. 
A pesar de lo difícil que fue la vida en Cuba para mí, yo dentro de toda esa dificultad, yo tuve de todo. Yo me vestí con las mejores ropas de la mesón. ¿eh? Yo tenía los mejores zapatos, los mejores perfumes. Y eso lo sabe en Cuba todo aquel que me conoció. Que por donde quiera que yo pasaba se sentía mi aroma de café. Ese es mi perfume preferido, el café. Aquí es donde vivimos desde que... Nos movimos para acá para Burkelke. Esta es mi casa. Cuando yo llegué aquí a Burkelke, yo empecé a ver todo el mundo vendiendo, todo el mundo vendiendo droga y todo el mundo buscándose la vida como pueda. Y ahí empecé y con ese dinero esa droga yo estuve comiendo. Pasen para acá. No se fijen en el reguero, por favor. Y viviendo hasta la fecha de hoy. Y fue bien difícil porque no tiene uno paz y tranquilidad nunca. Esta es de este, este es bombón, este es bombón, esta es de este es más. Es un ambiente de pistolas, balas, tiros, cuchillo, puñalada. El baño. Policía, la federal. Oh, Rabba, 
sangre de Cristo tiene poder. Gracias. Apocalipsis 20. ¿Dónde, va? ¿Dónde van? Dice, ¿cuál, ¿cuál es el fin de, de Satanás? Y todos aquellos que le siguen, es decir, los que viven como el diablo. Dios me, me hizo una prueba. Eh, venía un carro y me chocó. Fue un accidente, pero eh, estoy bien, gracias a Dios. Y a mi madre, que no se preocupe, que yo estoy bien. No importa el problema de la pierna. Dios no mira mi, mi pierna, Él mira mi corazón. Aquí, vemos yo en esta cama. Ahí. Estamos solo. Aquí me pongo yo con oración. Todo día hago, mi, hago mi, mis temas, mis mensajes que me llevo de la palabra de Dios. Y de gloria a Dios. So, uh, as I said, uh, investigative uh, documentaries and rigorous committed journalism allow the empowerment of citizens to make decisions that affect them in key aspects of their lives such as nutrition or health. Now I would like to show you some fragments from two different uh, documentaries that we made together. One of, uh, on one, uh, um, at one hand, uh, we have, do you really know what we eat on food on toxic uh, additives? On the other hand, uh, Bill in search of an illness, about the focus on the, of the pharmaceutical industry on selling more drugs even at the expense of the citizens' health. This is the, the introduction of this uh, first uh, film. Do you really know what we eat? The Puch Garcia family could be almost any Catalan family. In this documentary, the amateur theatre group Kulianaka from Terrassa will bring them to life. The Puch Garcia family is aware of the importance of a healthy, balanced diet. This is why they try to follow as best they can the advice of their doctor or recommendations they receive from the media. Does the Pooch Garcia family know that hidden within apparently healthy products are toxins which could be harmful to their health? Do we really know what we eat? What do we eat? What we eat is, without a doubt, the most important, 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 important means by which we are exposed to all types of contaminants. I'd say that between 95 and 98 percent, or even more, of the contaminants we receive daily come from the food we eat. From what I see, the people in my hometown are up to here with toxins. I also feel a little guilty that I could have been, over the years, helping to poison people with all that I've sold. We have scientific evidence that any given product is very toxic and is frequently used in the food we eat. There would be legislation to prohibit it. If we are to have fresh food products all year round, in abundance for the entire population that we are, this means that we must use systems of protection. We live with contaminants. 
és un It's a micro poisoning that's affecting many people that don't even know it and probably never will know it and many will die without knowing it. I don't believe that there's any industry that sells a product that they know is carcinogenic. I just don't believe it. To believe that, you have to have a twisted mind. Okay, here the, this is the introduction of this documentary. The question was, uh, what are we really eating when we eat? Is it safe? How many chemicals, heavy metals, antibiotics or additives that could be harmful to our health do we ingest on a daily basis? And the concern, of, the concern of many scientists focuses now on the health impact of these small uh, quantities of toxins that uh, we accumulate in our body and the so-called uh, cocktail effect. In other words, the unknown consequences of mixing of all, all, all these substances. This is uh, one excerpt, one, one of the histories about these toxins. It's, it's about aspartame. The sweetener called aspartame. Uf, no puc més. No va fer un refresc. Vinga, nemi. Light, eh? Light, sugar-free, low calorie. Claims often made by artificial sweeteners, which guarantee sweetness without gaining weight and harmless for diabetics. Among them, aspartame, also identified as E951, is present in over 6,000 products in our diet. Soft drinks, dairy products, cakes, chewing gum, candies, and even medicines offer a nice taste and no calories thanks to aspartame. But this chemical additive approved in the early 80s, over which there has been a lot of controversy, especially in the United States, where many consumers attribute their illnesses to aspartame. What we're going to do now is we're going over to the park. As you know, this is the 4th of July celebration. You have all these people and they'll be drinking sweet things. So we want to give them out these papers so they will know not to use aspartame and to save their life. In 1992, Betty Martini founded Mission Possible, an international organization named after a movie with an almost impossible goal, the banning of aspartame, an omnipresent product in the American diet and ever-increasing worldwide. We have independent studies for 30 years Every single one of them shows it to be unsafe. How can you tell me that it's safe? What you're doing is using industry studies. And if you saw the industry studies, you can't, you can't take make any study and make it show safety. Well, the reason it hasn't been banned is because of the influence of the aspartame industry with the FDA. That's the, that's the only reason. The FDA knows it, absolutely knows uh, that it's not safe. Here are some of the files. This is brain tumors. This is brain tumors. 
blindness, eye problems, they're everywhere. There's a whole box of them here. Box of them here. Box of them here. Box of them here. Everywhere. Thousands of cases. 50,000 cases of uh, people sick and dying on aspartame. They come in every single day. It's a mystery to me why individuals are upset about poorly supported and reported anecdotal claims of problems and people who have never looked at the data claiming that there are problems. Well, I feel that aspartame has been the result of Lisa's death. Lisa was a very healthy, vivacious, wonderful girl that loved life. And I cannot attribute anything else she did that would have brought this on. Being the fact that she drank so much of this soda and all these diet drinks, I think it's uh, a very, very, very bad substance. Where you go into a store and you buy something off of a shelf, you're assuming that it's uh, healthy. And now they're starting to realize this was a big mistake. What these companies are doing is just shameful, and there's, and they don't seem to care. And they, there's too much money behind it, and it's just, it's all money motivated. I know this. It's an accusation that I'm making. A lot of the things that we uh, talk about here may not be completely documented, but I think it will. And more and more truth comes out. They're going to find out what they've what they've been doing to people all these years, and God only knows how many people have died from this. Lisa's dead because of it. She had uh, she had another 30 years, and it, it was it was stolen from her. Aspartame, as we have said several times, and as other regulatory authorities have also said, is one of the most highly tested food additive materials uh, in history. It is reinforced by the fact that there are many countries around the whole world that have looked at the same data and have come to the same conclusion. NutraSweet is the dream product, but for some consumers and scientists, the dream may be too good to be true. Controversy has accompanied aspartame since its authorization in the U.S. and has reached the highest levels of government. In 1987, a Senate committee opened an investigation after receiving complaints from consumers and scientists denouncing the adverse effects of the sweetener, which in the U.S. was marketed under the name of NutraSweet. We should have every single authoritative scientific, medical and regulatory body in the United States and around the world arrived at a single identical conclusion, and that is that aspartame is safe. The board concluded that with regard to brain tumors, that safety had not been established and the substance should not be marketed. Okay. In August 1975, in a telephone conversation with the then general counsel... It's a tragedy and it's a shame. Uh, the real issue is that the public is, is consuming this drink it, consuming this substance, it's not only a drink, it's in over 5,500 uh, substances, products. They're consuming this uh, substance, believing that it has been shown to be safe. And clearly it has not been shown to be safe. Since its legalization in the United States in 1981, aspartame has been surrounded by controversy. Doctors and scientists suspected the sweetener caused brain damage and multiple tumors in mice. The company owner, Searle, was backed up by a study that established the benefits of aspartame. Although these studies received much criticism for irregularities, the US Food Safety Agency ruled that it posed no threat. The United States government does not have the personnel, it does not have the money, it does not have anything like the kinds of resources that it would need to have to conduct even 
the studies for one of these food additive materials. The FDA cannot be trusted on any issue. The way it makes its decisions is not scientifically and is not ethically. They make their decisions on the basis of power. So the FDA and the uh, individuals that uh, are working for the industry say, we don't see a problem. The, they don't say it's safe, by the way. They say we don't see a problem. All the people who have studied it from an objective point of view say, hey, look, it looks, it looks like a problem to us. The FDA put in place a very stringent set of regulations called the Good Laboratory Practices Regulations. And these very carefully stipulate how studies are to be conducted, that a protocol design, how the study is to be run, is to be submitted to the FDA. We look at it carefully. FDA, you know, has not done any, I think it's probably under a lot of pressure from the industry to do nothing. I worked for the government for 27 years. I know how it works. You get people that, that a lot of deep pockets that have economic interests come in and put pressure on the agency to do nothing. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. What does the inauguration of Ronald Reagan as the 40th President of the United States have to do with the approval of aspartame shortly after being sworn in? The Office of President of the United States. The Office of President of the United States. I like to do well at things. It, it's important to me that if you're given an assignment that you try to do it. The, the key best was you this can. man, Donald Rumsfeld, who soon joined the Reagan administration. Rumsfeld, later known for his involvement in the Iraq war with the Bush administration, at that time was the president of Searle, the company that introduced aspartame into the American diet. Donald Rumsfeld, the president of the Searle Drug Company and the person who uh, was the most, had the most to gain by the approval of NutraSweet, aspartame, was a key player in the Reagan transition team. And he said, I will call in all of my markers in Washington and get NutraSweet on the market by the end of 1981. See, NutraSweet's spoonful tastes great on cereal, The grape, approval fruit, of aspartame fat, was the beginning looks, for light products, especially like soft sugar. drinks. Spoon for spoon, and with zero calories per teaspoon, the new sweetener offered a seductive lifestyle, fun, when successful, fitness, and moreover, fat-free. Just one new drink. This lifestyle so soon spread worldwide. With just one calorie a can. And thanks to the new low cal sweetener, NutraSweet, just one. Get this little. Give me a light. My conclusion was that they did look into it, they found that it was going to be unsafe, and they concluded that this multi-billion dollar product that was supposed to replace sugar, remember they were going after a nine billion dollar market, was going to replace sugar, was too in jeopardy if they allowed serious objective studies to be conducted. I concluded at that point also that Donald Rumsfeld did not have really much concern about the health and well-being of individual people. Wendy is one of the many Americans who consider, rightly or wrongly, that she became ill due to aspartame. She attributes her recovery to a strict diet without this sweetener. And this is very difficult to do in the United States. Today, we're going to the supermarket with her where she's going to show us the presence of hundreds of aspartame products. <laughs> American shopping. This is the way a family would consume their foods. 
Uh, the sad part is, is we're not really getting food. We're just getting poisons and chemicals. We have no nutrition. Aspartame could be harmful if you ate a lot of it. That is, if we were big, really big consumers of aspartame, and if we took very high doses over a very long period of time. Certainly this is difficult in a normal diet unless a person makes an effort to eat everything that contains aspartame. It is difficult to reach these levels. We're talking about three or four coffees a day with aspartame, two or three yogurts, four or five sweets, and yes, with these amounts you will have eaten almost a gram a day. What you have to do is balance the risks and the benefits. Aspartame has shown that it can be useful, for example, for obese people that want to lose weight. And aspartame has shown that it can help diabetic patients control their diabetes. Therefore, we have to look at the benefits and the risks. And when we put them together, the benefits are much greater than the risks. The most intelligent approach is to simply, you know, it causes cancer, remove it from commerce. It costs money to remove the uh, substance from commerce and, and substitute it with a different substance. On the other hand, not to remove it potentially also causes money and maybe it costs a lot more money to society in terms of health care and treatment for the cancer and loss of life. So I think that yes it's an expensive situation and maybe it's a question of you know you know who pays the bill. Because until I started Nutrisweet I was a healthy if not fat overly heavy weight healthy guy. So I went on a strict diet. That's when I became diet conscious. And I thought I was doing myself good. When I had my drinks in those days, I had bourbon and diet coke. If I had coffee and tea, it was not with sugar, it was with Nutrisweet or Equal. And just before I was diagnosed with lupus, I had, I just really almost had paralysis. He said, I believe you have a aspartame poison, but don't quote me. I didn't even, that's the first time I'd ever heard the word. It went right in my way, right out the other. Because when I asked him about it, he said, look it up, go to a specialist. He wouldn't tell me anymore. I guess he was afraid to get into it. The Emory rheumatologist that I went to said, yeah, I believe you have lupus, and I believe it's probably caused by aspartame. And I said, you're the second doctor to mention that. This is very uncomfortable for me. Feeding tubes are very painful because it's a hell of a way to have to live, pumping liquid into your stomach. So the one thing I want everybody to be impressed with is it can happen to you. Believe me, it can happen to you, and the minute it hits you, it'll hit you like a gunshot. It's not worth it. It's not worth taking the risk. When one case, just one case is proved, I will be the first to say, don't use it anymore, we have other sweetness. Millions of doses of aspartame have been taken by children and people during their lives. Millions. Because it's in many things. Has there ever been even one case? There have been claims made, but nobody has proved anything. It has to be proved. It's a very dangerous product that is probably responsible for the ailments of many patients and more than likely even some deaths. And it's on the market. And what's more, it's hidden. Because it's hidden in cakes, it's hidden in drinks, it's hidden in pharmaceuticals, it's hidden in products for children. And here, we can't take risks. Barcelona has become a reference for all those who denounce the supposed dangers of aspartame. In 1997, Dr. Maria Alamange conducted an investigation, the Barcelona study, which showed that once inside the body, aspartame could cause some alterations. Aspartame is composed of two amino acids, aspartic acid and phenylalanine, accompanied by a small amount of methanol, that according to the manufacturers of the sweetener, the body eliminated easily. 
But the team of Dr. Alamange discovered that this was not true. To our surprise, we saw how it turns into formaldehyde, and this formaldehyde sticks to anything. Formaldehyde attaches to proteins, it attaches to DNA, it sticks to anything. But if you attach this to DNA, which is where the genetic information is, it's like going at a computer with a screwdriver, poking holes in the hard drive. You're poking holes in the main memory. But you say, I can still keep functioning. Yes, because we have redundant systems, but some cells are affected. The first feeling you have is that of being terrified, really terrified, because it's a product that we know is consumed on a large scale, and our results were very clear. Two hundred million people worldwide consume aspartame, many in Europe. Why was a product that arouses so many suspicions approved here? What does the EFSA, the European Food Safety Agency, have to say? I believe that a clear message should be given to the consumer. Today there is global consensus on the safety of aspartame. We've begun a re-evaluation, which will be over in a year. And then we'll see if we come to the same conclusions. The EFSA has re-evaluated aspartame up to five times, and each time has reached the same conclusion, that it did not represent any danger for human consumption. Studies like the one carried out in Barcelona, or by Dr. Mirando Sofriti in the prestigious Ramazzini Institute for Cancer Research in Bologna, are not considered sufficient to prohibit or restrict aspartame even with these findings. In the results of our study with female rats, using 20 milligrams per kilogram of weight, which is half the daily dose for humans, we saw a significant increase in the incidence of lymphomas and leukemia. These are just some of the types of tumors we found during our experiment. In 1997, Dr. Safriti did an experiment with 1,800 rats and saw an increase of leukemia in those that had consumed aspartame. In 2003, the experiment was repeated, this time with very low doses of aspartame, but administered to the animals starting before birth. Leukemia cases were repeated. In 2006, he did another experiment, this time with mice which after consuming aspartame had more liver and lung cancer. After conducting these experiments, we can affirm that aspartame, in our experimental conditions, can cause tumors in two animal species, rats and mice and in different parts of the body. Therefore, current regulations regarding the sweetener must be revised. Just because we find tumors in animals does not necessarily mean that we will find equivalent tumors in humans. For example, in the latest study by Professor Sofriti, we see that he used a type of mouse that, as far as tumors are concerned, are not good predictors of what will happen with humans. So, even though it's true that he has observed the presence of tumors, this doesn't necessarily mean that there's a danger for humans. Sofriti's studies were highly criticized by the proponents of aspartame, given that the Italian scientist decided not to kill the mice at 104 weeks, as is common in many laboratory experiments but let them live until their natural death, between 140 and 150 weeks. However, other scientists applaud him. When you sacrifice an animal at two years, that would be like studying humans to maybe age 60 or 65. Well, most humans don't get cancer by age 60 or 65. Humans get cancer as they get older. So if you were to terminate a study, 
and only study people up to 60 years, you, you wouldn't have a lot of information about cancer. Scientific studies are the raw materials, a bit like bricks in a wall. But we look at the whole wall, not just at one brick. Obviously, if the bricks are seriously flawed, the wall will not be stable and it can collapse. So we should look in detail at these studies. But what's important is to maintain a global vision of all the information and not just of one specific study. To finish these short screenings, uh, we are going to show uh, some clips from another documentary. Uh, the documentary is called Pill in Search of an Illness. As a country, Spain is among the world's top consumers of medicines. Do we take too many? Medicine saves lives, but can it be bad for our health? Els medicaments són la tercera causa de mort darrere de l'infart i del càncer. La gent ha de saber que una gran part de les malalties que tenim són causades per medicaments. L'expectativa de vida aquí a Espanya és de les més altes del món i els medicaments ben segur que ajuden a això a fer-ho possible. El fàrmac és un gran invent, però no en podem abusar. Ni el podem agafar com que sigui la pastilleta màgica que ho resol tot. No! De tots els països del món que està prescrivint més psicofàrmacs des de l'atenció primària és Espanya. And it keeps being at the top of the list in terms of profitable industries at the expense of a lot of people and a lot of lives. La industria farmacéutica es de todas las industrias, de todas, la más intervenida, la más vigilada. I hold the drug companies, and specifically Glaxo, Smith Klein, for Caitlin's death. There's no doubt about it that Addy saved our relationship and was a life changer for both Ben and me. The easiest way to sell pills is to sell ills. The easiest way to push product is to convince people that they're sick. One, uh, the idea was a little bit uh, that uh, surrounded by contaminants or confused uh, by message that sometimes seem contradictory between what is legal and what is safe, many consumers sometimes um, throw in the towel and with resignation say that in the end uh, everybody must die. But there really are alternatives. We think that there really are alternatives when it comes to a matter of public responsibilities and also personal attitude. In this other documentary, Pill in Search of an Illness, the question is, are we sicker or are we more medicated? What comes first, the drug or the disease? On the one hand, the benefit uh, of drugs in extension and quality of life is obvious. And on the other hand, diseases caused by drugs are the third main cause of death after heart attacks and cancer in wealthy countries. Uh, some diseases uh, seem to have increased dramatically. Who doesn't know a child with ADHD nowadays, for instance? or a person that suffer from depression. Diseases increase and drug consumption as well. In Spain, the, is, Spain is the second country in the world in consumption of antidepressants. Mm. But do we really need so much medication? It is necessary to take pills to deal with natural process of life, such as, for instance, the hot flashes of menopause, uh, of menopause or feeling sad after the death of a family member? Must one really have the cholesterol level under 200? Or does that just allow big pharmaceutical companies to sell millions of pills around the world? This is uh, one excerpt of this other uh, documentary. 
La farmacovigilancia es un aspecto esencial eh, actualmente sobre las garantías que, que, que dan los medicamentos y lo que hace es el vigilar que los riesgos no superan a los beneficios en ese medicamento en concreto. En el momento en que nosotros vemos que un riesgo supera a un beneficio, lo que hacemos es retirar ese medicamento del, del mercado. El tiempo que es tarda a retirar un medicamento porque produce efectos indesitjats greus que obligan a retirarlo del mercado, que fins a l'any 2004 o 2005 era de 6 o 7 o 8 años, ha pasado a 12 o 14 años. Es decir, costa molt més retirarlos del mercado. ¿Por qué? Eso es que, porque hay más influencia de la industria. Many of the new drugs that appear on the market are in fact old drugs with a slightly modified molecular structure and do not cure a new ailment. They may offer some advantage compared to existing medicines, but more often they allow a new patient application and a significant price increase. The safety of these new drugs is open to question because professionals do not have years of experience in their use. What's more, because the drugs are more expensive, they have a huge impact on public health systems. Después de unos 3 4 años, cuando hemos gastado billones de, de euros o dólares en este medicamento, estamos llegando a la, a, la, a la conclusión que realmente el medicamento no es muy eficaz o hasta que pueda haber causado muertos. The contribution medicine has made to society in terms of health and life expectancy is unquestionable. There are millions of people who are waiting for a cure for their illnesses to be discovered, as happened recently with Sophus Bovir, which cures hepatitis C. But the huge number of drugs available on the market does not always mean improved health outcomes. In fact, some experts think a few hundred products would be enough. Still, new drugs are constantly appearing, the pressure to get new products approved and the fact that it is the drug companies themselves that pay for the trials means that trials are becoming quicker and less thorough. They approve on less and less evidence. Uh, there is a lot of pressure to approve drugs with fewer clinical trials, sometimes just one. Durant 10 anys fem estudis abans de que un producte de mitja, 10 anys abans de que un producte pugui arribar a estar a disposició, és a dir, pugui arribar al mercat, que el puguem comercialitzar, el valor del producte per si mateix està, està demostrat, està ben, 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 ben estudiat. Eh? I per tant, hi ha garanties. If you're a drug company and you do 10 studies and six of them make the drug look better because they emphasize the benefits and, and don't really talk about the risks, and a couple of them really show some of the risks. The companies don't have to publish these other studies. Now, this is why in Europe, they are saying that once a drug is approved, that all the data should be made public. No publicar els assaigs clínics és comportament criminal. Ja és prou escandalós que no ens donin accés a aquestes dades. Ara, que no les donin al sistema de salut. Que l'Agència Espanyola del Medicament aprovi medicaments sense veure les dades de cadascun dels pacients que ha participat en els assaigs clínics. La seguridad, que es, lo que es el tema que hoy tratamos, pues, sin duda está absolutamente garantizado. Si no, ese medicamento se retiraría del mercado. Oh, I'm super excited. It's been five years since I took it, so I can't wait. Um, it's been a long, agonizing road. When I was on the clinical trial, um, I had restored desire and life was great again. And shortly, within two or three weeks after stopping it, it went away. I've tried numerous, you know, over-the-counter products and prescription products, none of which did for me what Addie did. So um, my husband is very patient and um, God has been very good, but we finally have it. <laughs> Amanda was one of the first people in the world to take Adi, the commercial name of Fliban Serena, the so-called female Viagra. The success of the pill that improved men's sexual function created expectations among women with low sex drives. The way the drug was developed was a familiar one. First, a new disease was defined, the so-called hypoactive sexual desire disorder, 
The company then repurposed an existing pill, an antidepressant that had never been a success. And suddenly, and without warning, I noticed that there was something different, that it was a lack of desire at the time. I felt alone. I felt guilty. There was a lot of guilt and shame. I mean, that's a very intimate bond between a man and a woman, and I missed it. So I often tell people it's like, um, if you love steak, um, but you couldn't taste it anymore. If your taste buds weren't working, would you want that steak as badly as you used to? Because you couldn't enjoy it. When she was not interested in having sex, uh, I definitely was worried that it was my fault. I wondered if it was something that I had said, was it something I had done? Yeah, I even wondered if she might be having an affair. I mean, that, that also crossed my mind. When Amanda was on the drug uh, during the trial, um, it really returned us to where we were in our relationship before she was on the drug. Uh, it uh, rekindled our uh, uh, sexual relationship and uh, really made all the difference in the world. Unlike male sexual excitement, which is visible and tangible, female desire is much more complex. And the route to approval for the so-called female Viagra has been complex too. Amanda volunteered for the clinical trials. For her, the effects were immediate. But the FDA twice refused to approve Adi because of its side effects. It only works for a small subset of women, with an increase of only one satisfying sexual experience per month compared to control subjects. They called me, you need to bring all your pills back and your handheld diary because the, the trial's been stopped because the FDA denied it. And I was devastated. And the worst was having to tell Ben that it was coming to an end so abruptly. And I tried everything in the world I possibly could. I read the Fifty Shades of Grey trilogy about 12 times, which worked temporarily um, to keep some um, sassiness and spiciness in our relationship. I literally tried everything, you know, role play, costumes, you know, anything to try to keep up what we had had, and it just simply didn't work. So for me, Addie was the only thing that did work. Hey, it's good to see you. How are you? I'm good. Brooke is a sex therapist and a firm believer in Addie. Despite the fact that it's a drug that must be taken for life, not only on the day when the user expects to have sex. And she expressed her support at the hearings organized by the FDA, where women suffering from low sex drive like Amanda made moving pleas for the product's approval. I want to want my husband. It is that simple. I implore you to approve phlebanserin. It certainly worked for me and thousands of other women. For us, phlebanserin is a life-saving relationship-saving and life-changing drug. Access to safe and effective FDA-approved treatments. But not everyone was so enthusiastic. Some critical voices saw a new medicalization of a part of life, sexuality, that is affected by many factors, including age or the state of a relationship. The FDA was also concerned by serious side effects, including high blood pressure and fainting. To review the way it interacts with alcohol, they asked for a new study which involved only 25 people. An example of the way some trials are conducted today. And alcohol makes it worse, a lot worse, in men, because they didn't do the study in women. It's just outrageous. It's unbelievable. That alone should have kept them from getting approval. But the FDA just gave up, I guess. Anyway, there are 23 men in that study and only two women. It's just ridiculous. It's unacceptable. Cheers. 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 Great job. Fine yeah. work. Despite this, the FDA approved Addy a few months ago. The agency found it hard to resist the pressure from female sufferers, allied to a powerful campaign that presented the issue in terms of sexual discrimination against women. Hey, did you guys hear the FDA just approved the first ever medication for women's sexual desire? I mean, this gives a whole new meaning to my four-hour erection. I know what to do with it. The ad says that since men have up to 26 drugs like Viagra, 
women should at least have one. Thanks, FDA. Even the score is the name of an umbrella organization created to lobby for the legalization of ADI. As we can see on its website, it's a consortium of professional and consumer organizations that are concerned with women's health. But behind it, there are various drug companies, including Sprout, the manufacturer of ADI, the pink pill. This is common practice, so much so that many pharmaceutical companies spend 30% of their budgets on marketing and advertising, more than on research and development. With one little pill a day, Viox can provide powerful 24-hour relief. Viox specifically targets only the COX-2 enzyme, a key source. Natural of life processes such as aging, mourning, or sadness each have their cures. These are the so-called lifestyle drugs, medicines that change our concept of health. A healthy person becomes a potential patient. These are 30-second ads, which you see people frolicking around, be walking through a beautiful countryside, playing with your grandchildren, people looking very healthy. It's a lifestyle they're selling. There's no information. Their biggest markets are for lifestyle conditions that almost everyone is either vulnerable to or can be convinced that they're vulnerable to. And these are drugs that have to be taken for the rest of your life. Risk factors become a threat of illness, which must be medicated right now and forever after. The new health model defines sugar, cholesterol, or blood pressure levels ever more stringently. Often the decisions that establish these limits are taken by international organizations, such as the World Health Organization, which are influenced by an industry that pays them millions of dollars every year. There has been an exaggeration enorme de el que en podem dir els llindars a partir dels quals hem de començar a tractar un problema. A partir de quan hem de tractar una xifra de pressió arterial? A partir de quan hem de tractar una xifra de colesterol? Jo no voldria generalitzar perquè hi ha grups de pacients que potser necessiten que se'ls tracti. Ara hi ha estudis que et diuen que tractar el colesterol elevat en una persona que no té altres factors de risc cardiovascular és un disbarat. Per què augmenta la mortalitat? No la disminueix, no és que no faci res, sinó que l'augmenta. Tractar la hipertensió arterial lleugera en persones que no tenen altres factors de risc cardiovascular augmenta la mortalitat no la disminueix, ni té un efecte neutral. And so many women got news after they had that screening that they had low bone density. Well, of course they did. They're 50. You know what bone density is compared to in the United States? It's compared to college students in San Diego, California. And they have wonderful bones. They're athletic, they're fit. The sun shines 365 days a year. Good morning. Good morning. We've talked the whole night through. Pharmaceutical companies are perfectly attuned to the aspirations of consumers who want an easy life without effort, diets, therapy, or physical exercise, and who do not want to accept the inexorable passage of time. One of the most profitable drugs of all time is Viagra. When I was diagnosed with prostate cancer, I was primarily concerned with ridding myself of the cancer. But secondly, I was concerned about possible post-operative side effects like erectile dysfunction, ED, often called impotence. You know, it's a little embarrassing to talk US about U.S. presidential it. candidate Bob Dole publicly announced that he was taking Viagra, a pill that was originally created for men who had been left impotent due to illness or advanced age. But this was too small a sector of the population for the drug's promoters, and they conducted surveys among men between 40 and 70 years old. The results were spectacular. 72% said they had erectile problems. Of course, in the questionnaires they completed, if in answer to even one question they mentioned occasional problems, they were labeled as suffering erectile dysfunction. But the market was ripe for expansion, 
and the company set out to find younger users. During the first decade of the 2000s, the biggest consumers of Viagra were men between 18 and 45 years old. Try Viagra. I'm crazy about your walk. I love the way you walk. One of the predictable consequences which the industry is pleased about, is it gets patients to go to their doctor and say, hey doc, there's this new drug on the market, it really looks good, um, why don't we try it? And the doctor is put under pressure and the doctor herself or himself may also not be adequately informed and may have seen the same ad, but nevertheless says, why not try it? They have to see patients rapidly and the fastest thing they can do is write a prescription. Uh, the doctor gets them out of the office in a hurry, and the patient feels that the doctor has taken him seriously uh, because patients have come to believe in the magic of these drugs. La gente empieza a tener una idea equivocada de los medicamentos, y es que es un bien de consumo cualquiera. El medicamento nunca es un bien de consumo cualquiera, y ya sabemos todos que todos conllevan, conllevan un riesgo. Es importante que ese mensaje le, lo tenga claro la, la población. Are you concerned about losing more hair? Do you wonder how much further it will go? Do you wish you could do something about it? Well, there's a pill for men with certain types of hair loss. It's called Propecia. In clinical studies, the vast majority of men, 83%... Vaig començar a prendre en els 21 anys. M'estava caient el cabell, vaig anar al dermatòleg. La primera opció que em va oferir el dermatòleg va ser prendre Propecia. I ja vaig notar que alguna cosa fallava al cap d'uns dies, perquè, no sé, m'agafava marejos, em trobava malament i em fallava la libido. Llavors vaig dir, doncs, deixo de prendre-m'ho. El problema és que després va ser bastant més greu. Vaig començar a tenir problemes molt greus, com pèrdua de massa muscular. Mentalment va ser com si, com si em prenguessin totes les emocions. Encara no ho he recuperat. Molt sovint m'aixeco i el primer que penso és que tinc ganes de suïcidar-me. I no sé per què. És com si he deixat de viure per passar a existir. I és com si... Jo és que l'única manera que tinc d'explicar-ho és que t'arrenca l'ànima. Propecia has, has taken away the last five years of my life. Who knows how much longer? Uh, it's terrifying. It's terrifying to me that Propecia is still being sold. There's undoubtedly somebody out there right now taking Propecia for the first time who is um, going to have their life turned upside down. It's frustrating and it makes me angry. Carlos and Michael live 6,000 kilometers apart but what they have in common are lives that have been turned upside down by the side effects they say they've experienced after taking Propecia. Finasteride is the main active ingredient in this medication, which was initially destined to treat prostate ailments. As with so many drugs, an unexpected effect was noticed during trials. It promoted hair growth, and so Propecia was born, a way of preventing and reversing male pattern baldness. The leaflet warned of possible side effects that would disappear after discontinuing treatment. But in the cases of Michael, Carlos, and thousands of other users around the world, this has not happened. I began to feel, uh, I guess what I would describe as sexual side effects, uh, lowered libido, um, some erectile dysfunction, um, reduced semen volume, um, reduced uh, sensation when I would orgasm. Um, obviously all these things were, were very scary, um, so I decided pretty much at that point that, you know, whatever risks were, whatever was occurring to me was certainly not worth keeping my hair, um, so I stopped at that point. I loved being an editor. I haven't read a book in five years. Um, I haven't been able to. Um, the only thing that I read now is, is really the newspaper. Um, Basically because the, you know, as most people know, the writing is more straightforward. It's all, it's all very factual. Um, there's not any metaphor or, or allusions or um, any sort of literary elements. And even that is very challenging for me. 
you know, being an editor and working at that sort of level, it's, it's just not possible for me with my, with my cognitive impairment. How's it going today? I uh, cannot make enough money to fully support myself. I am a 32-year-old living with his mother. So my life is, is different in every way. In many ways, it's the polar opposite of what it would be right now. And um, it's been this way for essentially five years now. Em vaig quedar bastant tranquil després de llegir el prospecte. El prospecte deia que podria haver algun petit problema en el tema sexual, només. I que un cop deixaves la medicació, el problema desapareixia. So when I took it, there was zero um, indication that there were any sort of long-term effects of Propecia. Um, the drug label in 2012 was changed to say um, that uh, sexual side effects can develop in some men and continue, uh, in some men they can continue after stopping the drug. Millions of American men use to combat baldness and grow hair. It's Propecia made by Merck, and it did $134 million in sales for them last year. But tonight, there are new questions about possible side effects. We get our report from our chief medical editor, Dr. Nancy Snyderman. In the summer of 2012, the George Washington University published its research. Not only did Propecia have serious side effects on sexual function, these effects might never go away. For the first time, there was clear evidence of an increase in depression and suicidal tendencies. This placed in doubt the information provided by Merck, Sharp, and Dome, who had to change their leaflets, even though the number of people affected was small. It involved thousands of men. And I was shocked to actually see so many cases written on the internet, but this had never been described yet in the medical literature. I started to see several patients, and the findings were quite astounding. So 75% of these men had some degree of depressive symptoms, and 41% actually had suicidal thoughts. And I think that people really need to know that. Both doctors need to counsel patients before they prescribe it, and, uh, and then potential patients also need to be aware that this has been reported. My son... Uh was taking Propecia for a couple of years and uh, for male pattern baldness. Uh, he was in his early 20s. It was pretty devastating. Um, he had most of the symptoms, um, including the brain fog, the insomnia, the impotence, uh, extremely depressed. And in spite of our best efforts, it was like it just, you know, slipped through our fingers. You know, it was, uh, yeah, it was rough. The suicide of his son, Randy, led Dr. John Santman to start an organization for people affected by Propecia. The World Health Organization has reports of almost 13,000 cases of negative reactions to the drug. People from all over the world contact Santman's foundation, in despair because the symptoms aren't going away, and because most doctors are not aware of a syndrome, which for the time being has no cure. Today he receives a call from a victim in Spain. Let me start off with uh, saying that if it's any consolation, your story is amazingly familiar. <laughs> yes, yes. I have heard uh, it many, uh, many yes. times before. For many other sufferers like me, the Foundation, the Pono Finastia Foundation, is the only hope. To be honest, uh, in Spain, everything has been fruitless. I've been visiting about uh, 10 endocrinologists, more or less, and none of them has been able to even to consider that these effects have something to do with the uh, finasteride. Often I'll hear that the patients are told that it's all in your head and there's really nothing wrong. Yes, that's right. As you probably know, there's, there's no proven effective treatment at this point. Hopeful that in the midterm, again, not within the next year or two, but in the, in the five or 10 year range, that we'll have, uh, we'll have some really significant stuff. If you have a small study, you're not going to pick up an uncommon or a rare side effect. So for example, if a side effect occurs in one in 10,000 people, if you only study 1,000 people, you're unlikely going to pick it up. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist, it just means that the study didn't have enough people. 
a lot of the studies also did a very poor job at looking at safety and at risks. I think a natural reaction for someone like me would be to blame Merck, but um, I try not to do that. And uh, I think it's ultimately the result of the system and the structure, and that I don't think Propecia is really all that unique. Drugs that should never have gotten on the market, they got on the market because the FDA has been weakened because it's funded largely in terms of drug review, bought directly by the pharmaceutical industry in, in terms of cash. A partir del mes de gener, als Estats Units es comercialitzarà un fàrmac que s'ha demostrat que evita la caiguda del cabell i a més té efectes regeneratius que en fan sortir de nou. Often, the emergence of a new drug, whether for a serious illness or a trivial condition, becomes a news story. Apparently, independent physicians, who are in fact often connected to the companies promoting the drug, are called on to present the scientific discovery. In the case of Propecia, Dr. Ken Washenik appeared on news programs all over the world to discuss its virtues, with all the credibility conferred by his status as a researcher at New York University. But a simple internet search reveals that he also works at one of the most famous hair clinics in the USA. On their webpage, they promote and sell Propecia, mentioning only its positive effects. They buy the medical profession. There are very few physicians, and certainly important physicians, in well-respected academic medical centers who do not take money from the drug companies in one way or another. I'm a physician. Do you think that just because I get $25,000 as a consultant from a company that it's got any, any influence on me? And the answer is, of course it will, but you're in deep denial because you don't admit to yourself or anyone else that your decision making is influenced by the industry. So in this case, uh, we talk about this um, uh, responsibilities that are shared because it's not only an issue about the pharmaceutical uh, industry. Uh, many doctors recognize their responsibility when it comes to um, quick prescriptions, uh, often linked uh, to the lack of time uh, on medical visits. And uh, finally, there is a figure of the consumer, um, someone looking for the magical pill or the magical pills uh, that will allow them to live an eternal and perfect and uncomplicated life. Uh, that it's, a con it's probably it's an incompatible concept uh, with the life itself. No? So I think that uh, now we can start with uh, some comments from uh, Richard and some uh, Questions and comments. Uh, what it, it's worth pointing out that I think there were maybe four years between the time that we did uh, what is it that we're eating and the time that we did uh, pills in search of an illness. The first one, the, what are we eating, as you noticed, um, the FDA provided a spokesperson for us. Um, <laughs> For the second one, probably because our name was in some sort of database, uh, the FDA refused categorically to talk to us uh, about it. Um, but the people that we talked to for that last one that you saw were people like Marsha Angel, who was the editor for 10 years of the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, Alan Francis, who edited the DMV, the fourth DMV, uh, they, they were high, really high-ranking people. They weren't, Betty Martini, she was a strange person about aspartame. I didn't really, you couldn't tell whether or not, you know, Betty Martini was a real clear thinker. But the people that we talked to about in this last one, uh, who told us that because the FDA, now the studies that the FDA does on new drugs are sponsored by the pharmaceutical companies who want to put it on the market, uh, and various other sources of pressure that the FDA is really not reliably protecting uh, the American public. And it scared me half to death, actually, to, to listen to these people who've been in the Washington power structure for a long time uh, make these declarations. Uh, it was a very scary thing. With, with the aspartame, although I had a 
little bit of difficulty believing Betty Martini once I found out that, in fact, aspartame had been put on hold for further experiments, and that the first thing, actually, that uh, Ronald Reagan did was to appoint a new FDA director when he came into, in, in, into office. That was his first act. And shortly thereafter, of course, he brought Rumsfeld with him. Shortly thereafter, aspartame was approved. Um, uh, these things, uh, well, I think they scared and shocked us, <laughs> even though we kind of expected it, no? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the other thing I did want to add was this. Propecia, mm -hmm. the baldness drug, that causes confusion, difficulty in concentrating, mm -hmm. mental fogginess, it turns out that Donald Trump has been taking Propecia on a regular <laughs> basis. <laughs> now, this is not a joke. His physician it's true, it's true. actually said, that his ex-physician probably by now, he's been taking it on a regular basis for a number of years. Uh, maybe he's not in the small minority of people who are severely affected by it, but on the other hand, <laughs> who knows? You know, uh, he's got a hell of a hair, head of hair. Uh, this is true, but he doesn't make, uh, he's not too clear-minded. Your, your work has pointed out the, 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 the relationship between um, documentary work and then sort of citizen engagement. Uh, have you seen a growth in sort of watchdog groups, sort of citizen groups talking about toxins, the drug industry? Uh, advocacy groups. I just wonder if, if there's a parallel development. Let me address this and then Monsik can probably speak to it better than I can. The one, for me as a journalist, the most difficult thing about practicing journalism in Spain is that there is no sunshine law. There is no access to information. Uh, journalists have no right to demand to see how public money is spent on anything from the inspections of nursery schools to buying nuclear arms. Uh, and it makes investigative reporting uh, very difficult, if not impossible. Uh, when you call somebody and you say uh, you want to get a comment, usually they hang up. Uh, you can't get those kinds of things. And that's something that, uh, although there are many really hardworking, great journalists in Spain, uh, they're severely handicapped by the lack of a sunshine law and real transparency, no? Yes, it's true. It's, it's very difficult. So it's very difficult to uh, to demonstrate, to, to, to show the, um, the conflict of interest. It's very difficult. It's, it's true. It's exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is that in this documentaries, uh, we want to show that it's not a local problem. It's not a, a United States, uh, a North American uh, issue or a Spanish issue. Uh, food industry or pharmaceutical industry are uh, one of the most important and richest industries in the world. Uh, some pharmaceutical, the, the pharmaceutical industry earns more money than uh, oil and uh, our, um, weapons uh, industry. Mm -hmm. So they are very, very, very powerful uh, industry. And doesn't matter, for instance, in, in our documentary, we, we, we have uh, another, another um, example about uh, an antidepressant uh, called Paxil. Mm -hmm. Paxil uh, was gift to, uh, uh, to millions of adolescents in North America. At last, uh, GlaxoSmithKline, the, the, the company, the, the, the pharmaceutical uh, company, uh, had a, a, big f a big fee. I think it was uh, fined with $2,400 million, the highest fee in history against a pharmaceutical company, but to hide the serious uh, side effect on adolescents. In our do documentary, uh, we demonstrate how the sales represent, represent uh, um, uh, hide, uh, receive orders, that, orders to hide this information that this the Paxil was uh, not indicated for young people. And in our documentary, we show parents that lost their children. Uh, but doesn't matter for GlaxoSmithKline. This big fee 
is nothing because every year there earns billions and billions of dollars. So the question is, if our administrations, I'm not talking only about uh, the North American administration, but if our administration, Spanish, uh, Catalan, North American administration, uh, don't protect us, we think that we as a journalist, our obligation is to give this information in order that the, 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 the citizen have a, a tool, have a weapon uh, uh, to, to fight against um, this situation. In the other documentary, uh, we, um, we focused in this ideal family uh, uh, which every member of the family, family are concerned about cholesterol, fat, it's the, the perfect family, it's the healthy family. But they are, uh, they are taking a lot of poison with sweeteners, uh, with antibiotics uh, in, in, in daily products, in meat, in chicken, etc. Uh, in, in Spain, for instance, you know the, Medi the Mediterranean diet, uh, we eat a lot of of, um, of fish, and now doctors are uh, recommending to pregnant women and children not to eat so much fish. Excuse me? It's me that I don't have to, to, to eat uh, so much fish? Why don't you uh, feed the industry that are throwing to the waters all these kind of heavy metals like mercurium, uh, etc.? It's my problem, it's my obligation not to, to, not to eat so much fish? Or is your obligation as administration to close or to, feed or to feed these industries? So if we don't have this information, if we, don't, if we receive only this kind of public uh, campaigns, eat fish, be careful with, with your cholesterol, you are, a, you are a good citizen that follow this kind of official advice, but the, 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 the truth is another one. So uh, I think that we share this idea that we, as a, as a journalist, and especially journalists as, as us, that we work in a public media, that means that we are paid by our citizens. It's our obligation to give this information, to, to, to make research in this, in this very big industry that doesn't want, uh, they, they didn't want to, to talk with us. No, no, no. Neither, no. neither GlaxoSmithKline, no. uh, nor, uh, I don't know, Pfizer, et cetera, et cetera, Merck, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They don't care because if, if they can withstand a $2.4 billion fine, what do they care? What even the New York Times is going to print much less public television in Catalonia, so it's mm -hmm. very difficult. Thank you. Um, thank you very much to both of you for this incredible, scary story. But um, anyway, so considering then this is a overwhelming um, conspiracy towards health and well-being and knowledge, then how, as journalists, do you uh, counterattack that publicly? Because then it's exposing yourselves, you know, and how does, how does the, um, I want to say, so the tug of wars between uh, policy and all these interests affect the TV or the medium through which you make these public? We, uh, it, uh, I think that Monse had, 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 is a great, uh, she handles the management side of the station, for instance, very well. They were concerned because uh, although it's a public station, they take ads. Huh? And they don't have the numbers of ads that you may have here for pharmaceutical products, uh, but they have a lot of ads for pharmaceutical products. And I think you had to go through a lot of negotiation. Yes, uh, and, and with the, uh, the, the food uh, industry, because we have, um, we have commercials food and of, drugs this, both. Yeah. of these uh, companies. So maybe um, 
we are here talking about journalism, of course, about health and food, etc. Uh, but for me, one answer is to have a strong journalism, uh, uh, to have a strong investigative journalism. And now it's, uh, it's, it's stranger and stranger because uh, the, the medias don't want to pay for this kind of investigation. Of course, it's, uh, it's, um, uh, it's expensive, it's more expensive, this kind of documentaries. One minute of our documentaries are expensive, are more expensive than one minute on a, a live uh, TV uh, news saying, I don't know, it's raining, it's a heavy rain. Not only here in, in, in the States, uh, in Europe as well. So in this crisis, crisis um, um, times, for instance, uh, for instance, our our station suffer um, a reduction of uh, of people three years, four years ago, uh, and they they fired a lot of people. Among them, Carlos Bosch, the director of Balcedos. We don't have any other director of documentaries in Catalonia and in Spain as well that arrive so far with a documentary and they decide to fire people um, with uh, what criteria? In this case was the age. From 61 uh, years old, you are going to be fired. So, uh, it, 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 and it's especially, uh, I remember during this time, uh, my documentaries, for instance, El del Valle de los Caídos, was put as an example of the kind of product that our station have to have to finish has to finish because it's expensive but but we are a public station if we don't make this kind of documentaries what kind of 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 television are going to make this kind of documentaries al menos in España <laughs> here the, the 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 private journalism is completely different it's completely different. But it's true, it's expensive. When people talk about, um, talk about internet, I remember, maybe not no, uh, nowadays, but some years ago, people was very afraid about journalism in internet. Uh, mm, talk about internet as a, um, uh, as a danger for journalism. And now I think that uh, it's it's good times for for journalism because I, I think that we we are able to show that good journalism, investigative journalism, is another thing, and probably you have to pay for this kind of journalism. You have to pay for the the New York Times, for the Washington Post, and probably for some screenings in uh, of this kind of documentaries, because if we don't pay. What are we waiting for? Uh, that pay Coca-Cola or to pay uh, GlaxoSmithKline? These kind of companies paid a lot, of, uh, pay a lot of money to journalism, to journalists, um, uh, uh, and to doctors and as well. But uh, uh, organizing this kind of events. Uh, travels uh, and it's difficult we are human it's difficult to resist the temptation to spend uh, one week in Hawaii talking about the new miracle with uh, uh, bold people with, and with propatia and etc and, and we are human as well when we want to to um, uh, to think that it's possible this kind of eternal life, uh, no? Sure. So to deal with all these um, elements, sometimes it's difficult. And probably, probably, I don't want to talk about us as a heroes, of course, uh, we are workers. It's important to, to, to realize that we, the journalists, we are workers. And, uh, but but I, I think that um, that uh, that it's important to say that 
to make this kind of journalism is not, a, an, is not only an, an issue about money. Of course, we need money to make this kind of documentaries. But sometimes we need brave directors that want to deal with this kind of issues. And sometimes it's the worst of our, um, our um, job to deal with these uh, core directors. When we are in our ages, it's not very nice to see some faces of our directors because we are disturbing with this kind of subjects. And I have to recognize that our little, small public television allow us to make these documentaries. Maybe with more problems that I want, but at last we can, we can do these, these it's documentaries. Very rare among television stations in all the world, yeah. uh, for a, such a small station with such, you know, small viewership, few million, uh, to let us do what we do because we don't go out with a script. We don't, they don't say, okay, you got to give us your script and you got to stick right to it. And it, no, we go out with a certain number of days, which we can sometimes extend if we have to, but we can shoot what we find. And that's, you know, this is the great thing about this station. And it's been, always been a pleasure to work for them. You go out and you do what you find and then you come back and you put it together. And, and, and it's a very unusual, very unusual thing, which I think has a lot to do with the mm -hmm. fact that uh, these kinds of documentaries have gotten made. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't okay. know if you want any other thing. <laughs> Perhaps if there's no other question, you're going to ask more questions over a glass of wine outside. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Yes. 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 The, I can. I can. I can promise that it's a wine without aspartame. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.